My home is wherever my books are. I realized that when I moved to Missouri, that that was when I, I left Illinois, which is where my books had been for years at that point. And when I went to pack up all of my books, the bookcases upon bookcases of them, I think I had about four bookcases full of uh, fiction, um, I realized I couldn't take them all with me, that there, there was kind of a limit. And so I gave away about half of them. I gave them to a local library, so that a lot of them ended up in circulation. And I, I kept what I was gonna read again. And what I realized after I looked at the, what I'd kept is that I'd basically kept the, the great trilogies of the last, of the 20th century, I guess you'd say 20th century fantasy. The, the writings of like Frank Herbert with Dune, uh, David Eddings, Terry Brooks, Weiss and Hickman, Donaldson, R.A. Salvatore. Um, if you've read the Harry Potter series, these are all the authors that sort of laid the groundwork for what she did. They sort of established the genre of fantasy, swords, magic, all that stuff. And the thing about trilogies, um, the series that authors tend to use, is there are some ways a story is told that we sort of begin to expect. The pat there are patterns. Um, to use the Star Wars trilogy, the original Star Wars trilogy as an example, I'm gonna guess a lot of people have seen that. The, the first movie or the first book Star Wars A New Hope, right? Introduces the world, the characters, how, how things work. So in the Star Wars A New Hope, it's Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker, the Force, and like, it, it doesn't resolve much, but it introduces you to the world. The second book, the second part of a trilogy, the second movie is where the, the problem uh, gets a little bit more complicated. The challenge is uh, start to be, become clearer, but um, they tend to end on a hard note. Uh, the, the Empire Strikes Back, the second part of the Star Wars trilogy, ends with Han Solo, Frozen, and Carbonite. Um, then the third piece of the trilogy is the resolution, where things get sort of worked out. The Return of the Jedi and the Death Star is blown up. Today is so to speak, the first in a trilogy. We're, we're looking at a, a trilogy uh, as, as that's the way I read. When I'm reading uh, it's Genesis and Genesis in the 30s, we start reading into the, the story of Joseph, the, the next main character. We've had Abram, uh, Abraham, uh, then, then his son Isaac, and then Jacob, and now we have Joseph. And Joseph is sort of the last sort of patriarch, one of the last to get us through to the end uh, of, of Genesis. And so today, um, a problem will happen. It won't be resolved, but we'll be able to get to know the people. And maybe just like at the end of Star Wars, where the scene where they have the, the where Han Solo and Luke Skywalker, they get the awards. Maybe we'll find someone we can look at too and say, ah, they've, they've done something impressive. So, uh, to, we got to start by meeting the brothers. Joseph is one of 12 brothers, and, and the brothers are going to drive this story. The brothers are the children of the two wives of, of Jacob. If you remember, Jacob had two wives. The wife that he wanted, uh, Rachel, the younger daughter, and then the wife he was tricked into marrying, Leah, the, the older daughter of his uncle Laban. And so um, Jacob has these two wives, and Leah starts having children first. And they name their children in interesting ways. The, the names are really kind of on the nose, you might say. Like the first son to be born, the eldest is Reuben, whose name means see, or behold, a son. Like As in like, look at me, I have a kid, look at me, husband, pay attention to me. And then his second... The second son of Leah is a Simeon, uh, which means God hears, as in God hears my prayers that my husband would pay attention to me. Um, the third son is Levi, which is the word, the name Levi means attached. 
is that I want my husband to be attached to me and pay attention to him. You sense the theme here, right? Uh, Judah, the next son, means that name means praise God. Then Rachel has some children, and the theme continues. Uh, the names of the children all mean something. Um, the last two sons to be born are the children of Rachel. Joseph, which means God has added, as this, this child has been added as a gift. And Benjamin, which means son of the right hand. So the right hand is this place of honor, so maybe honored son. Uh, Benjamin, uh, his mother dies in childbirth. And so his uh, mother, actually, uh, she tries to name him Ben-Oni, or son of sorrows, as, as she is dying in the her uh, husband, uh, Jacob, instead uh, names him Benjamin, uh, son of the right hand, honored son. So now there, there's this close attachment that, that Jacob will have to his last two sons, his youngest sons, to Joseph and Benjamin, because they are the sons of his the beloved wife, of Rachel, the wife he wanted to have. And uh, the, and then Benjamin is the, the son that she gave her life to have, died in childbirth. So these sons, they do get into some trouble. Uh, they can get into trouble all by themselves. You want an example? Go read Genesis 34, uh, where two of the sons, Simeon and Levi, uh, take matters into their own hands when their sister Dinah is hurt. And that's a whole other story. But um, knowing that the sons are, can be a little bit much, we, it's, we get to Genesis 37. And we start hearing about Joseph. Genesis 37, Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. So Joseph is tattling on his older brothers tattling on his older brothers when he's 17. He's 17, which means he is old enough to be doing the work himself. Bar Mitzvah, the age of accountability, the age at which you can start taking care of your business, is 13 in, in the Jewish culture, in the Jewish time. Like at 13, you can get married, you can have a farm, you can be part of the business of running the farm. And so he, um, at 17, he, he shouldn't be tattling on his brothers, he should be working with his, his brothers. And so uh, this is a problem. Now, Jacob loved Joseph, we read, more than all of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a very colored tunic. This is the term that's hard to translate. King James says coat of many colors. That's the catchy term. That's what uh, leads to Joseph in the amazing Technicolor dream coat, the musical. The new uh, authorized uh, NAS translation says long robe with sleeves. The Tanakh, the Jewish translation, says ornamented tunic. I, I think the, the challenge of the word is not so much, I, I think what matters about this word is not so much to pin down exactly what it is that's being worn, but to make the connection. Like the other time that this word is used to describe what someone is wearing in scripture, it's used to describe one of the daughters of King David, uh, who is uh, be, being like honored and she is wearing something long and obviously not what you're gonna work in, right? The, this long tunic, if he's wearing this tunic, he's not showing up in blue jeans and Carhartt t-shirt. He's showing up in something long and flowy and ornamented and not, he's, he's not gonna get his hands dirty wearing this. He's not gonna help them. So his father, or his brothers saw that their father loved him, Joseph, more than all his brothers. So they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. No surprise. Favoritism among brothers. This, it's been the running theme through Genesis, brothers not getting along. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, please listen to this dream. For behold, we are binding sheaves in the field and... Behold, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect, and behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. 
Then his brothers said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Are you going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Joseph, not being the most observant lad, not only tells them this dream, he tells them another dream he has about how all, his, his, uh, all the sun and the moon are going to bow down to him. It's not just going to be his, his brothers, but his parents even are going to bow down to him, which his father does get a little bit annoyed at. Then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem, and Jacob said to Joseph, Are you not... Are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? I will send you to them. And he, he went. Which again gets at, like, he's just not working. Like, all the other brothers have taken the flock off to pasture them to work and, and make sure that they're fed. And did Joseph go with them? Nope, he stayed home, such that his dad says, Oh, where are your brothers at? Oh, they're out doing work. Oh, I'll send you too. And he's just not doing any work. Then Jacob said to Joseph, Go now, see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock, and bring word back to me. Like, Jacob doesn't even send Joseph to go do work. Jacob sends Joseph to go see how they're doing and then come back and tell me about it. When the brothers saw him from a distance and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. And they said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Joseph has tattled on them before. He is wearing his fancy clothes. He's not going to help. He may be about to tell them about another dream he's had, about how they're going to bow down to him, the ones who do all the work. And, you know, they've had enough. They've had enough, which is horrible and, and, and just a, a horrible thing to have happened. But they're fried. And it's not changing. Their dad's not seeing that this is a problem. Now then, we read, Come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and we will say a wild beast devoured him. Then we'll see what became of, becomes of his dreams. Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, Let us not take his life. Reuben further said, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him, so that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped him of his tunic, the multicolored tunic, they took him and threw him in the pit, and the pit was empty without water in it. Then they sat down and ate a meal. As they raised their eyes, they beheld a caravan of Ishmaelites coming with cam camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it for us to kill our, bro our brother? Come, let us sell him, and now lay our hands on him. And his brothers listened to him, and so they sold Joseph for 20 shekels of silver. Now Reuben returned to the pit, and Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments, and he returned to his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic, slaughtered a male goat, dipped the tunic in blood, and they sent the coat to their father, and he examined it and said, It's my son's tunic. And they went to the father and said, A wild beast has devoured him. So Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on, and mourned his son. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. So if, we're, if this is a trilogy, like the three parts of telling the story of Joseph, this is where the first movie ends. This is where the first book wraps up. Because at this point, we've, we've met everyone. At this point, we have firmly established the problem uh, that, uh, just like Luke in the first Star Wars, who just wants to go to Tashi Station for some power converters and is whining about it, like, Joseph is kind of a whiny brat. Um, and, and so we come to this end of this movie, and if we're going to look for who is the, the hero of the moment, who's the one who gets the, we should look at and say, ah, they're onto something. Like, who do we need to pay attention to here? Um, I think it's Reuben. Reuben is the brother who says, who heard this and rescued him out of their hands by saying, let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, shed no blood, throw him into the pit so that he might go back later and get him. In that moment when the other brothers are, are getting in on and they're ready to, to kill their brother, 
Reuben is the one who speaks up. And to speak up when everyone else is on the bandwagon, they're all charging towards a common goal, that's a challenge. Not easy to speak up when there's a group of people and they're all wanting to do something. To speak up and say, hey, let's do something different. Like, man. But that's what saves Joseph's life. When I went to Truman State, up in Kirksville, which is that way where I'm standing, it was at a very interesting moment with the regards to what had just become possible. CD burners were available for the first time. This was a 1998. So CD availables were available for the first time and I had one, a four speed CD burner, it's very cutting edge. Uh, LAN networks have been wired into the dorm. So we had ethernet high speed uh, connections. This is back when uh, most people at home had dial up. To, so back when you had like, you, you dialed up, you, ah, you could only dial up or make a phone call. You couldn't do both. Uh, smartphones were just still a good decade off, really. And um, so I got to Truman and we had fast internet. Napster had just been invented. This program that for a couple years was the program that young people used to share all the music, all the CDs. You could take a CD and you could put it into your CD drive and copy it onto your hard drive and throw those files up on Napster and people could grab them. And high speed internet, you could just easily grab them, quickly grab them, and then you'd burn them to CDs. And uh, I got to Truman and I started burning CDs left and right. They had a, uh, the music, the library had a CD, CD, so they had CDs there. And so between all the pop music that I was grabbing from other people at Truman, all the, the jazz CDs I was getting from the library, like I, I probably burned 150 CDs of, of just great music. And, and uh, that's what people were, were doing. Like I, 1998, iPods hadn't been invented. As I said, smartphones were still a decade off. And most people were listening to music on the little Discman, the little CD players that you could carry around and throw in your bag and run headphones out of. And so that's what I saw most people doing. Or I saw more burned CDs, copied CDs, than I saw regular CDs like you buy in, in the store. And so that's my freshman year. That was like the key part of what was going on that freshman year for me, just discovering a lot of music. And then my sophomore year, second year at college, I was invited to the campus ministry, started getting involved in the church. I'm reading the Bible for the first time and uh, really reading it for myself. And I went on a mission trip. And we went to Rocky Mount, North Carolina. And so, I mean, that's a long drive to get to North Carolina. So I brought my CDs and I'm listening to these on the drive over. 15 passenger van, we had two 15 passenger vans full of college students. And so on spring break. And um, I was showing some of these CDs, my big binder of all these CDs, to a lady named Megan, who was a, a vocal major, very talented musician. Uh, lives in St. Louis now, a uh, very cool person. And she made a comment that, and I must confess the exact wording, what she said escapes me. It's been a while now, since 1998, 99, back then. But um, she looked at my, all my discs and I was just excited and sharing all this music with her. And uh, she said, you know, I'm just not so sure about burning discs. Like, I'm not sure about doing that. And, and I don't, she didn't explicitly say, to the best of my memory, she didn't explicitly say, like, because we follow Jesus and because it's not the right thing to do. She didn't, like, get on her high horse and, and lecture me. It was just one or two, just a line, like, just not sure about doing that. But, you know, us on a mission trip, we're there because we're following Jesus, attempting to love our neighbor and take following Jesus seriously. And, and I made that connection. And as far as I can remember, it was the first time I had heard anyone speak up that maybe what a lot of other people were doing, even if they were all doing it, because as I said, like this was just common. This is 
very common for that time period that um, just because a bunch of other people were doing it, it didn't mean it was right. Maybe we shouldn't be doing it. In that moment, she was Reuben for me. I don't, to this day, I don't know if she really realizes it, um, but she's the one who spoke up. No one else had. I got back to Kirksville from the, the trip and I, I wrote down the, all the CDs that I had copied because I loved the music. And, and then I threw away all the burned CDs. And um, it was that moment, it was like, it was a big deal for me. Because it was a moment in which I said, you know, because I follow Jesus, I want to do what's right. And it's right to support the artists who are, are creating this music and it's not right to steal the music. And so I, I threw away something I loved and then I went back and, and I bought a bunch of those CDs again, bought them legally and support the musicians. Um, but in that moment, she had been a Reuben for me, and I was thankful for it. Um, yeah. It, it was a small thing. No one's life was on the line. No one was about to be thrown into a pit or anything like that. But for me to real that to reevaluate what I was doing in light of being someone that was trying to follow Jesus, like that was a big deal for me. Uh, it's a process I'm still doing. Like what does following Jesus mean for how I live each part of my, my life. And I'm still figuring that out. I don't think I'll ever be done figuring it out. In this first chunk of the story of Joseph, this first part of the trilogy, Reuben is the hero of the moment. Maybe what we take from this is twofold. We take from it a bit of encouragement that like Reuben, we can speak up. We can slow down when everyone else is moving along, everyone else, whatever group it's in, and we're all in a bunch of different groups, right? To whatever group we're in, to be able to slow down and say, so what we're talking about right now, is this in line? Does this, would this make Jesus smile? Would this be good? Would this be something I, I can be proud of and share our joys and concerns at church, right? It is a joy, right? Um, and if not, can I say a word? I'm not sure about this. Maybe we should think about this differently. And second, as much as we can wish that we would always be the Rubens, maybe we can remind, be reminded that other people can be Ruben for us. That uh, we can be reminded that we, we do need to be listening for the people who do speak up. Because as much as we would love to be the person who's always the one who's got it figured out and worked out and saying, ah, we need to think about this. I, I know I'm not. I need people like Megan to speak up. And so not only do I need to be slowing down to pay attention to what the group I'm in is doing, but also being willing to listen to what other people are saying. Because maybe they need, I need them to be Reuben for me this time, today. Amen.